What's up, Andy? Welcome hey, to Robert, Big Hey, Robert, how camp. are you? I am good. How are you? Fantastic. I love the campfire. Yeah, right? It's like, I, I think it's cozy and I like having the the crackling in, in the background. I always look at it yeah. and I'm like, I wonder if we were actually on those chairs, you know, what would, what would be in the coffee mugs? If you were on those chairs... Yeah, although would those chairs a are a little too close tea? for me because I... It... Yeah, I'd have my feet in the fire. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So you're tall? Yeah, six foot three, 190 centimeters. Nice. I have to, I have to be honest. I'm, I beat you a little bit. I'm also oh. pretty tall. I'm I'm six I'm six nine. Oh my goodness! That's that's not by my son beats me by a little bit. He's six foot five. You beat me by a lot. <laughs> but you're used to in in American standards. Then you are tall, tall, right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So thank you for joining me at the campfire. I really appreciate it. Um, I I think I have a lot of questions for you, right? But I actually. I would like to start out. You are venture capitalist, really software software guy, uh, yep. and also author. Yes. Uh, and actually, the reason you are here today is because you authored uh, the One Percent Leadership, right? Um, and you asked some really good questions of me to a post that I I added <laughs> in. But I want to start out just saying, out of all of the leadership books that's in the universe, and there's a lot, right? That there's. A few things there are where there has been written so much uh, about about a topic as leadership you know what is what is the things that you feel were missing in that mix for you to go through the you know pretty lengthy task of actually doing the work of writing a great book you know what is the key essence you feel you're you are adding to that mix so i think the the biggest thing oh i have a list of things that i think are missing but the biggest <laughs> thing is almost every book equates leadership with authority. And so most of the leadership books that are out there are authority books. They tell you, once you have authority, here is how to use it. And we, we phrase that as if it were leadership. Uh, leadership is what people do every single day. Like you show up to work, and I don't care if you're the most junior employee in the organization, if you're having a bad day and you're downcast and dejected, you bring down everybody around you. That's negative leadership. If you come in and you're chipper, you know, not toxically, but you just come in and you're positive and you have a good attitude, that affects your coworkers. Everybody's uplifted. That's leadership. And so one of the single biggest things that I think is missing is that leadership starts with leading yourself. It's, you know, frankly, self-help is a form of leadership. You know, yes. how do you get to the point that you're protecting and taking care of yourself and your energy? Because all that leadership is, is making work more effective. Whatever your work is, whether it's in a job, in a community organization, as a parent, right? You turn energy into value and you waste a lot of your energy. Leadership is all of the skills that help you protect that energy and produce more value. And so leadership is personal, it's team, it's organizational. And so I think that's what for me was missing. Um, the other thing that was missing is I think a lot of leadership books out there could be written in one tweet. And the authors are just really good at turning one tweet into like 350 pages. Um, so so <laughs> when I wrote my book, I did the exact opposite. Every chapter starts with a tweet. Like literally the chapter titles have to fit inside a tweet. And they are the summary of the chapter. If you read it and you completely understand what I meant in the title, skip the chapter, then go to the next one. There's 54 chapters. They're all standalone. And they're just leadership skills. I love that. I think that's so fascinating. Is it how long is your book? Because I actually I many times, especially these days, it seems like being an author back in the days was about creating like long volumes of work. Right? Yep. That, no, it's very like, short. Hey, it's, paper page. Yeah, it's well, about 45,000 words. Yeah, um, which I think is like 230 pages, I'd have to go pull my book off the shelf to, yeah, yeah. to check for sure. Every chapter which is standalone on average is 762 words. That's it. It's a complete is lesson a in two to three pages. Yourself? Is that a fixed rule you gave yourself that it has to be it had to be 750 words was my target number. Um, and so there's there's a couple that are like 1200 words. and There's a couple that are 500 words. So but on average, yeah. You know, my goal was 750 words per chapter, and I ended up at 762, so I'm pretty happy with that. Because oh, so I figure I'm spending enough time writing this 
that I should make it as clear and simple as understandable as possible so that somebody doesn't have to guess what the lesson is. Like the lesson is right there. If it doesn't apply to you, then great, move on to the next chapter. Because there will be lessons, there will be skills that I think are important that either you've already mastered and you're good at, or you've tried and they won't work for you. And I don't want you to get frustrated and stop and be like, okay, this book isn't for me. That chapter isn't for you. Just go to the next one. It's only a couple pages away. I love it. I love all of it. And and my point before was actually to say, when I read now, I would I would much more prefer what you're doing. I mean, it's it's like I I would prefer <laughs> a 50 page book at the same length as a 250 page book because right. for me it just means that the author has you know it's the old I can't remember the uh, the saying but it's like I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have time I didn't have to time to write a short one, one. <laughs> Wait, who you remember who quote who, who's quote I don't I don't recall who that one is but it's a, it's a famous one but it's just but so I think spot on right it's spot on and part of I think there's two different reasons why authors normally don't do that one is a number of the authors in this space are academics they're really mm. publishing proofs they're making one argument and they have to prove their argument and so they need that space to do it the yeah. other is they are serial authors and therefore they they want to have as many books as possible and so limit how many ideas you use per book because otherwise you might run out of ideas um, i have no intention of writing a hundred books um, if i write two more um, that would be, be amazing enough. for me. Oh. <laughs> uh, I would much rather have people like really, really understand and grok this book. And so literally, if you take the book and I have I have one of the manuscript copies in front of me, you can basically turn to the very beginning and the table of contents just has all of the summaries of every chapter. So you can just see what the chapters are about. The, these these names aren't weird and obscure. They're literally like, here's the summary of the lesson. I love it. So many things. Uh, so if we go back, there's a couple of things I want to ask. So authority vs. leadership, right? So if you look at authority, what you mean with authority or what I hear you say is authority is when you actually have the power to decide over somebody. So e.g. Right. I'm, a, I'm a manager, I'm a boss over somebody. Where what you, the way you view le leadership is much more of a way of uh, so leading yourself. So it's is it is it more than just influencing other people? Because I think in many cases, when people talk about leadership, it's always a how do you reflect and influence people around you? Well, yep. it sounds like almost that leadership for you, and if you focus in on leadership of self, could be how do you just lead yourself to be yep. so I break healthy, it into, have a human or something yeah. like that. I break it into three categories, right? There's leadership of self. Yes. And the important part of that is you have to be able to lead yourself so that when you do have authority over someone, whether you're a manager or a coach, you can tell them things that you have tried that work and don't work. Right. If I tell you, you know, it's really important that you take care of your health and wellness, but I don't do it. I'm an inauthentic leader. You won't believe me. So that's sort of one category of leadership is the individual. Another category is what I have to think of as team leadership, which is the people that you directly interact with, which could be the people who work for you or could be your peers. You know, one of my favorite things in team leadership is celebrating victories builds relationships like you said, hey, Andy, you, you got a book out. Let's let's hop on here. Like that has strengthened our relationship because you're helping me celebrate a victory. Like you're not my boss. I'm not your boss. This is just a, hey, let's do this thing. And, you know, going forward, like that gives us this you know, relationship that maybe we'll maybe we'll turn into something. Maybe won't. Who knows? Um, but it's a little it's a little improvement there. Um, and then there's organizational leadership. And that's what people tend to think of when they talk about leadership is, okay, I have a large organization. How do I make sure it's headed in the direction I want it to head? That's so fascinating. I'm laughing because I literally, when I, um, the way I teach leadership, when I talk leadership with my own team, my own people, and every, everyone at 24slice.com, right? I have three levels. Yep. And I call it I call it leadership of self, leadership of people, and leadership of leaders. <laughs> it's just 
basically what, right. you just, what you just yeah, that's but the, you're the only person other than myself I've ever heard talk about it like in that in that aspect and I because well, the important the, thing is is that as, as a leader of leaders like you will say things are important like I don't know anybody who's ever said like I want the the line people in my organization to work themselves to the bone like nobody ever says that they're like yeah it's important that people take holidays that they rest but they say that and then they give out KPIs and they're like, here's how many things we have to get done. Here's how many slides we have to churn out. By the way, I just submitted a talk for, for my book. It'll be fascinating. Um, somebody's going to be like watching this and be like, oh, that's I'm, I'm working on the slides for this. Um, <laughs> right. So you put out all these KPIs. And so yeah. your managers only see the KPIs. And so what they do is they push down and they say, OK, well, I need you to get these KPIs done. And somebody's like, well, I, I had a vacation this weekend. They're like, well, you better work overtime to get that done. And so what the individual manager here is, is that the organizational leader who said wellness matters is lying. Yes. Right? Even though that yes. was not your intent. And so one of the things we have to do as organizational leaders is pay attention to these big gorillas that are stomping all over our organization because our metrics don't match our words. Yes. Ah, oh, that is fascinating. Yeah. Many things to unpack. If if you look at the, um, have you used this? Like practically, is is this also like you you've been a leader yourself? You you built teams. Yes. You work with a lot. Is this the same way that you kind of use this when you talk to your own teams? About Absolutely. Every every lesson in this book is a lesson that I personally have used. And I've or I've, you know, actually, I think I've used every one of them. Some of them are better that other people used. One of my favorites is the apology budget. Um, what is that? Is it, so you have people that work for you, right? Yes. Do they ever get something wrong to an outsider? And do you have to go apologize on their behalf? Yes. Right. They should know they're, that that's rarely, okay. Rarely, rarely, I would say. But it, it's, ah, but it, it see, here's the problem. If if they don't know it's okay, then they become afraid to take risk. And, and so if you that, want to help agree, develop yeah. someone, they need to know that you've got their back, that if, that if they screw up, you will go apologize. And the apology yes. is something like this. It's like, look, I screwed up because I didn't give them enough support. It's not their fault. It's my fault. And look, yes. if you say that to a peer, they're like, yeah, I totally get it. We all have that, you know, person that we're trying to develop and they make mistakes. Great. Thanks. I'm glad you've got their back. And it allows your team to take risks and learn how to fly. If they know that it's not going to be that when they screw up, you come down and say, look, I had to apologize. Don't ever make me do that again. <laughs> Is that well, next time they're going to be like, well, I won't try something new and they don't learn. Is that how it normally is? In your experience, you have more experience than me across many uh, organizations. Is that more the default? Am I well, so more the default is, yeah, people, when if somebody has to apologize, they throw the person under the bus and they're like, oh my God, yeah, I'm sorry about my person. They were an awful train wreck. I will deal with this. Like that's, that's the norm and it inhibits growth. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I, it's not the same words that I use, but I have the T the leaders I have that, you know, I, I have moved to the leaders of lead of things. So when I talk to them, that actually the first thing I told them was to say, um, I like to don't have too many rules. So people kind of like what you say, they can take risks, they can try stuff out. I think you need that to have innovation and, and to get yep. the full value out of people, right? But but one of the things I said to them where it's like, there's few things where you're, you're going to get in real trouble with me. But number one is exactly that. If you throw your team under the bus, right. right? So I said, default from my perspective, when you are managing a team of people, if everything goes well, it's your team's fault. If everything goes wrong, it's your fault. Exactly. That's just, and that's just the standard, and that's how you have to approach everything. Yes. Uh, I also believe it's to be true, but I think from a mindset standpoint, it's incredibly important. And I agree with exactly what you say that it's. If you have that, especially when the team sees it, and that's where I, I, that's what I never gotten about the other types of organization because I, I see the power when I've tried it many times where, you know, one of my, one from my team did something that was not 
the right thing to do. And my completely gut reaction was to say, hey, I'm really sorry. I forgot to brief Team Mender X the right way. Yep. So uh, the, the output we got was not exactly like we wanted to. You know, they see that instantly. And right. it just means motivation, performance, you know, all of that stuff just skyrockets, right? Is right, because now you get to you say, have? like, what did I do wrong? Oh, like, I gave you the job of briefing, of creating a briefing for a senior executive, and I never reviewed it. That's on me. Like, yes. we didn't set up time for me to do a pre-brief with you and help you make this better. Let's solve that for next time. That's my yeah, fault. I agree. But you can't yep. take it to the extreme, right? I remember <laughs> I, I, I had one of my people, and I briefed her very thoroughly on... We were we were having a candidate in. We wanted to do a role play with a candidate. She was going to play customer. Candidate was going to play a twenty four slide salesperson, right? Okay. Uh, and I briefed her. I would say very thoroughly <laughs> on how on how I expected her to act on twenty four slides, and then um, she acted very differently from that. And completely intuitive in it, I said, you know, I didn't brief her well enough, uh, you know. So actually, what we tried to do was. She was much harder on the candidate than what right. she was supposed to do, which ended up being really funny. Uh, but she recognized the second that I said it, and she was just like, yeah. So what Robert is trying to say is he actually briefed me really well, uh, and I misunderstood everything he said, <laughs> you know. But then you right. still have that, you know, she know that I tried to kind of take the right. blame. And, and, and you get that good relationship out of it, right? Absolutely. I love it. I have a question because the reason we started talking – was I posted something on LinkedIn about, you know, how to be personal and professional in, in a leadership role, right? And yep. as I recall it is, I'm very far down the line of, personally, I find it really hard to have any kind of difference between personal Robert and professional Robert. So it's like, I've, I've just gone all in and I'm, I'm just yep. pretty, pretty much trying to just be like, and, and do that and make that work right and it seemed to me like you had a different um, impression and maybe that it would make sense to have um, a different approach to that that i would love yep. to hear more about I'm, so one of the challenges that you face as a leader in an organization is that you don't get to control personally whether or not those people are going to remain in the organization and neither do they right Tomorrow, it could be, and I'm not leaking any material information, I don't know anything, but like tomorrow you could get told, hey, by the way, we're you know, having a really bad quarter, lay off half of your team. Yes. Right? That's just we don't what could happen. Quarter, and I will not, but I agree. Right? Theoretically, so, theoretically that could theoretically, happen. Theoretically, um, in some hypothetical other company, so nobody, yes. nobody thinks this is really what's going on. Um, and like that's a reality that you, you will have to do. And so that's a different relationship. Like if, look, I've had to lay off a friend before. Like I was literally best man at his wedding and I have to lay him off. Yeah. And that's brutal and hard and you have to be able to separate that. But the, there's an important distinction here, which is in a work context, people cannot be your friends. It's okay to like them. You can't dislike them though. And the problem is, is that they are self-interested and that's appropriate. Somebody who works for you should have their own best interest at heart over yours as their employer. But yes. if they're your friend, that's betrayal. If they decide to go take another job because they like that better, like your friend wouldn't do that to you. It's like, imagine a friend saying, hey, you know, Robert, it's great that we go out to movies every Thursday night, but, you know, Sarah's got a better movie night, so I'm going to go hang out with her now. Like, mm. you would be really offended if your friend did that to you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so as long as you can hold both things in your head, that, that I like these people, we are friendly, we have an environment that feels somewhat familial, but it is not a family at the end of the day. People get to choose to leave. I want to make it that they don't feel like they want to leave. And I think this is, you have to be of two minds, which is in one mind, this is a cold, impersonal relationship. There's a financial transaction going on here. We're paying you for your time. And the other is, and we want you to feel comfortable in this space, and I personally like you. But the moment you start to dislike someone, which is what happens when you start to try to be a friend and that fails, you dislike yes. someone, you can't lead them correctly. 
And that's the danger for me of friendship. And I have lots of people with whom I'm very friendly in work environments. And then when I leave, we become great friends. It's like, oh, look, we don't work together anymore. We can be friends now because we don't have that relationship in the way. That's fascinating. It's, um, I agree and I disagree. So what I, what I think, and this is, is a hard one. So you're happy to disagree. No, no, but it's, it's a, there's an authentic authenticity thing. So the friend part, I actually, uh, I think I agree on it. It, I think it comes down to how do you define being a friend, right? Uh, yeah. but for me, it's more bringing your full self to work, you know, the difference between having, yeah, I would, I would actually argue that uh, when you say at the at the bottom of it, the cold, that the, it's a cold relationship, it's a transactional relationship, I actually think is, I actually think it's different in our company. Uh, and I know that I might be like, uh, <laughs> no. and so the, you, but you might not see it that separate way. Separate them, there's two different relationships and they ride right on top of each other. Right. The employment yes. relationship itself is a very cold transactional relationship. We pay you to do stuff as a leader. I am leading a group of people who have chosen to be paid to do this, and I'm going to help us perform better. I'm going to be friendly. I'm going to create this environment. But at the end of the day, and I'm a steward of where you are, I'm not your family, but I'm your steward. Like my greatest wish for everybody who has ever worked for me is that they leave. It's hard actually to get them to leave um, when you have that wish. When I say, look, I want to help you succeed and thrive and outgrow me, which means you'll have to go somewhere else. Yes. Like, I don't say that to my kids. I want you to get out of my family. Like, no, no, sorry, no, no. You, you are stuck with me. Yes. Um, and what can happen is that that relationship you built on top of the transactional relationship can actually outlast the transactions. Yes. But if you but try to tie I, them together, you break yes. them, right? So th mm. that's the trick is to say, look, I am your mentor while you are here. And I'm going to acknowledge that and be full up and honest that if like something happens and we've got to let you go, we'll let you go. And that doesn't change the fact that I like you. No. But I'm not tying these that tightly together. They just ride one gently on top of the other. Yes. No, no, but I we 100% we agree. And it's it's the same thing because that is exactly, I think my point of it is, um aligning their personal interest with what creates value in the company i think right. is, is probably one of the most important things to do right so it's like and that that's that's where i think at least that we compared to other organizations i've been in before is where we really try to do it differently because if you manage to do that i had a conversation with with one of my team members and i asked him you know hey, so what do you want to do he was like i would like to run my own company <laughs> i was right. like that's Okay, that's awesome. When do you want to do it? And he was like, three to six months. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a that's a little, uh, little fast, my friend. Let's teach right? you about how really, hard that step is. <laughs> he was really good, right? So he, he wanted to build an outsourcing product company. Um, and then I asked him, I was like, okay, so what will it take for you to be successful in doing that? He was like, ah, you know, I don't know. He was a young guy, you know, so he, he hadn't thought it really through. So I just helped him think through it. And I was like, okay, so we agree. So what you what do you want to do? And he was like, I want to build a company that can do X, Y, Z. And I said, okay, in order mm -hmm. to be successful with that, do we agree you need to be really good at hiring good people? Yes. Do we agree you need to be able to motivate them, train them, make them better? Yep. Yes. Do we agree you need to be a great leader that can motivate? Yes. I said, okay, you, you, you're not that now. So do this for us. And then once you've done it, you get the learnings. It's lower risk for you because you won't be, you're getting a salary. It's like, right. then once you get to that point, you acquired those skills, leave the company, I'll help you. You, you know, we might help co-invest. Right. And that's, that's great leadership right there. That I, I'm dumbfounded. Did, did you do something similar? Oh, like, absolutely. Maybe not do, yeah. So one of the things I tell everybody, is I, t I tell my managers especially, I say, don't ever have a performance development conversation about the person's next job. Have it about two jobs away because the next job, everybody's going to argue them say, well, I'm ready for my promotion. Give it to me right now. But if you say two jobs from now, like, oh, you want to go found a company? That's two, two roles away. Great. What are all of the things you need to do? Let's get you those trainings. 
Because here's what happens. First of all, everybody is wrong about how long it takes. Yes. Okay, he thinks three to six months. I'm thinking three to six years. Um, but if you're going to train him to do all of those things, well, you just took somebody who was going to quit in six months. Yes. And have turned them into a multi-year employee who is hyper-engaged, is going to be returning value. And as yes. they develop as a leader, that's going to propagate across your organization it's going to yes. uplift everyone. And so think about how much value you created just by being willing to say, look, you want to leave the company, I will help you do so. And I'll make sure that you get everything you need while you're here before it's time to go. So here's a million dollar or multi-million dollar question, right? Because this, I'm completely dumbfounded on why more companies is not doing it this way. And I, I find that it's very few companies where you, when you have career conversations or development talks that you say, okay, instead of framing this around, how do you become successful at my company? Yep. You just you just clear those walls out and then you say, it's not about my company. It's about you, the person. And it's about how do I, the manager or leader, help you become successful basically in life. I mean, like, like, like what, what is it you would really like to achieve? And then just accepting that, there is a short to, to to middle term period where you would probably the best way that you can be moving towards whatever success you have in life is being at this company and, you know, picking up skills. Maybe it's five years, maybe it's two years, maybe it's one year, but let's talk about that, right? So you have that. And I'm like, it's, it's so crazy to me that more companies is not like that this like yeah. everybody's not doing this. So I have I have lots of different theories on this one, and I think it's hard to pick one that answers why why this is so rare. Um, I think one is short term focus. So many people are focused on delivery, like we see this all the time. People put out a job description; mm -hmm. they want to hire somebody who can already do the job, rather than saying I want to hire somebody who I can train to do the job within six months. And yeah, so you get this, people this that are actually, yeah, this is right? more interim to longer term. Focus. Right. So they focus on the transaction. Well, I'll come, I'll do the job. And then as soon as I'm ready for the next one, I'm out of here because you're clearly not invested in training me. I think one of it is that we are so busy that as managers, like this is foreign. And in many companies, we have individual contributors who have never learned leadership who become managers and get taught transactional management skills. So they're taught, okay, here's how to fire people, here's how to hire people. And they don't get the benefit of sitting down and talking about leadership early on in their career. Like I was blessed, I was uh, in the United States Air Force and I was a cadet in, our, in what's called the Reserve Officers Training Corps. And so like, I got so much leadership training shoved down my throat when I was still in college. And then I go into the Air Force as a second lieutenant, and I actually had nobody working for me. It's very weird. I'm an officer, and I have like nobody. Um, <laughs> I was in a I was in a technical squadron. We had as many officers as enlisted, um, which was very awkward. And then my next posting, I showed up, and I was supposed to have three people, and I ended up with zero. So in the entire Air Force, I never <laughs> had staff that worked for me. It was amazing my entire career there. Um, but I had all this leadership training. So like I was, I thought I was ready. I, I was more ready, I think, than most people are. Yeah. And then as I'm growing my organization, you know, there was a lot of chaos. You know, I was at, started at Akamai in 2000. Like we went through yeah. the dot-com crash. Then we went through another crash in 2008. And, you know, for me, continuity of my staff was the most important thing. Like how do I make sure that I don't lose people because they want to go somewhere else. So I just listened to them. What did they need? What did they want? And you know, what are the leadership lessons that I've heard from others? And I think the best leadership lesson that the Air Force teaches us, um, and all the US military does, and I don't know how other military services do this, but you don't get to stay in a job for more than three years. Like after three years, you're transferred to somewhere else. So the day That's you walk a into That's a role- That's a hardcore fact. Yeah. Like you don't get to stay in a job. So the day you come in, you are already planning to train your replacement. Like you won't get to see your replacement. So you just get to, you will leave and then somebody will show up at some time after you. Um, there's no training. It's whatever you left behind for them. Like, did you leave the job better than you got it? With documentation, with processes, with everybody around you being better so that the next person has an easier go of it. Like we're just trained in doing that from the beginning. Not everybody succeeds at it. No. But when you bring that into the civilian world, it's like, okay, somebody just got promoted to 
you know, senior software engineer. Yes. In three years, I expect, even if it's not a, a hard promotion with a new title, I'm going to give them more responsibility and whatever they're currently doing will slowly slide to someone else. So how are we developing them to make that next step? For me, that was just natural. I assumed you should do that. And I know all too many managers who don't. They assume people will self-develop. In your experience, how much... I don't know if I, if I would even call it leadership training because one of the things I, I had a family member that was promoted in, yep. in a law in a in a construction company actually or a entrepreneur something like they build really big buildings and a lot of them right so she's in the legal <laughs> department uh, and she became the head of legal and I said how many people is in that team she was like twenty two so just having 22 direct reports for me is like wow that's a lot of people i said so how do they prepare you what training do you get she was like nothing she was like i what do you mean right and i was like um what and then i asked her like i was just curious what about the framework so you know you know do you do one-on-ones do you do them weekly bi-weekly monthly you know how they, and she was like, yeah, you know, they had this quarterly, whatever, you know how it is. You have a yeah, quarterly, quarterly all hands with the then, whole team, and, right? Yeah, And then, then every year you have your review conversation about salary increases, you know, that in, incredibly crazy way of doing it. But she basically got zero training. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, and I, I, I've asked a couple of other people and it seems to me that it's like when we talk leadership training and talking about the value of leadership, it is like a C-level thing. C-level slash SVP, it's like that's where you spend resources like bringing in consultants and we train them in. It's like the leaders of leaders thing where it seems like the people that move from being individual contributors, which in our world is leader of selves, into like leader of people. That's where we need resources. it. It's so yeah. crazy. And that's why they need it, right? Because those are the people that's like, you need to fire your team and you need to do this type of stuff. Right. I, I told my, I, we're working really hard at it at, at 24 slides because when we finally got, we're bootstrapped. So we're kind of, you grow a little bit here and there. Yep. Grow a little, got, you know, so you get enough <laughs> revenue, you get to grow you a little choose, more. Right? It's like, how do we? Yeah. So now we, we finally got to the point we have a problem management team. But when we brought in a people success person or an HR chief of, you know, somebody who, who runs uh, happiness of our people, the first thing I told her is like, we have zero leadership training and we have many team leaders. And I was like, the opportunity for us company-wide of just of just that oh Imagine yeah every, i mean the opportunity of doing next leveling that and she was like yeah i i fully get it so she's straight into like building up that part of it right and i just think it's well so you can wonderful. introduce her to a guy who just wrote a book yes exactly <laughs> Exactly. Who knows a thing or two about it? Yeah. I'm a little bit scared because I, I, on a random basis, share books and I'm like, this is so, I, you know, I read this one and, you know, <laughs> you know, I think it would be nice if we talk about all this stuff, but they're busy people and not all people read. At, at, yeah. At, well, know. so what's, what I like about my book is the, like, you can send somebody just the table of contents and say, do any yeah, of these, fr these sentences you hook you? It's just three pages. Like, boom. <sighs> Yeah, I already have your book on my to-do list. I should have read it before we spoke now, but it's like I... I well, really now you're really excited it. to go read it. I, I am. I actually, I wanted to not read it before this because I wanted to ask questions to you to kind of understand how it works, but I'm super excited to read it. Super excited. I mean, you you, you had me at, <laughs> at I'm writing less and I'm using like smart brevity to kind of get it to something much more focused because that's... Yeah, I'm regularly annoyed about not doing that. I mean, I would pay the same amount of money for reading, you know, going through 50 pages, 250 yeah. pages. Yeah, like there's a reason that people pages, right? people buy these books that are summaries of other books. Yes. Right, or the podcast is like, oh, I'll do the one minute version of, like I dare somebody to try to do a one minute version of my book that is not just read the table of contents. Like yes. you could do a one minute version of the over, oh, it's, it's 54 lessons, but you can't summarize the 54 lessons without just reading the table of contents. But then those ones I don't like, right? Because it's like, yeah, I I find that some context is missing. So I get yeah. somebody else's impression of what is the value of a book, and it's never the same as my own. So I I don't like. But I this is exactly the model: the actual author spending more time distilling their ideas, 
to yeah. a point. Yeah, this is three years. Understood, right? Yeah, it's three years, years to write the book. That's crazy. That's so. Well, I, the, here's the way I look at it because I'm a I'm a prof professional presenter, yes. right? I get up, I do keynotes in front of you know two thousand, two thousand, three thousand people. So yes. if I do a thirty minute keynote in front of three thousand people, yeah, that is fifteen hundred listener person hours. Yes. Why would I not spend an extra hundred hours designing that talk to be as beautiful and as crisp and succinct as possible to maximize how much value that 1500 hours produces the same thing for writing a book? Yes. Yeah. And then you could say normally when you go through a book, because it is a slow format, it takes three years. The idea has to be timeless, right? That's one of the reasons yeah. I like books in the first place it's like you get out of the entire social media breaking news it, you know that the speed is so high because in order for somebody to spend the time and effort like you spending time and effort you know creating the book the ideas has to be kind of timeless right they have yep. to really withstand and and that normally means that the value of them is so much higher yeah I and i hope i think it's timeless but we'll we'll ha let time tell us we'll see i if I'm I'm really looking forward to going. I'm really looking forward to it now. I want to go back to the constraints because I actually that's one of the things I think is so interesting. It's also a little bit aligned with us being bootstrapped because we talk about that constantly, the difference between just getting venture money in and then continuing to be bootstrapped. Being bootstrapped adds so many constraints to a business, like yep. how we evaluate stuff and costs, etc. But then I also believe that constraints reads creativity right it, it it forces you to be more creative those constraints you mentioned about size and time and stuff well that's something where you sat down and say i want to constrain myself because i want the end product to be better yep that's basically it that's so i guess the reality is that you you set the constraints and they're different constraints right sometimes environment gives them to you sometimes you do it yourself but it's important to know, like, what is the realm you're actually working within? Yeah. Right. I think because I think of values are a form of constraint. Like I had a value with my organization. We had called it global engagement. Yes. Right. Because my team originally was based entirely in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Like we all came into work. We all actually sat in one room for a couple of years. That was really painful, actually. Um, it was a construction zone that we actually worked out of. Um, and then like I got one person who was remote. And I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. We're like they can dial in. And then we made an acquisition and we had a team in Fort Lauderdale. And we're working yeah. on that. And then we we expanded into Krakow. So now I'm in like multiple time zones. And I had this realization, and, we, and it wasn't just me, like my whole leadership team were, were talking, that it was like, it was really difficult for people who were not in the room in Cambridge. They felt disconnected. It you know represented everything everywhere else. And so I had said, you know, this, this just needs to be evaluated. It's a constraint on us. And so how does that play out? Well, it means that if I'm on a staff meeting with people in a foreign location, by foreign, I just mean not Cambridge. So it included Fort yeah. Lauderdale. You know, it was, we, also, we often joked it was our southern, uh, southern nation. Um, we would, when we disconnected the video, I got up and I walked out of the room. I didn't say anything. No words to anybody in the room in Cambridge. No. So, because the people who were remote needed to know that there wasn't an after meeting. Interesting. That if we couldn't talk about it in front of them, you know, I'd walk back and, oh, we can now have a conversation over instant messaging. Like we've got chat programs that everybody's on. Um, right. So do that. Or, and, you know, the, I'll admit this is the place where, where I've had to re, re resurrect that skill working with my slide designer who works in a different time zone from me is you get used to when you're in the one time zone using messaging as a chat. I can ask a quick question. If you didn't understand it, you can ask me a clarifying question. I'll come back. Yeah. But if I'm a 12 hour cycle off from someone and they ask a quick question and I'm confused, it could mean one of four things. The onus is on me here's because I have this constraint that I have to write four different answers and send them all. And say, I don't know what you meant. Did you mean this? If so, here's my answer. If you meant this, here's my answer. Yeah. Because otherwise I lose 24 hours to asking a clarifying question. I want to go back to the uh, what you mentioned about the after meeting. Because we actually, we just had that. 
24 slides. So was that a real thing that you did in yeah. in your company? So you decided to well, say- Well, it wasn't the whole company. I mean, it was my organization. But yeah, like when I would end my staff meeting and yeah. we turned off the video conferencing, everyone I was the done. Room. There's no after meeting. No, no. So everyone left the room. Yep. Interesting. I, I saw another place, a uh, hybrid work organization. They actually decided that if anyone was remote, everyone was remote. So, so yep. it was literally like they would be sitting five people in a room, everyone on their own laptop with headphones on because somebody was remote. So they kind of aligned it all. Well, I, I don't know if I, I, li I actually like that because I've, I'm now in meetings where there are people who are like, there's three people in a one conference room and six of us who are remote. And the, first of all, we can't see the facial expressions of the three people because no. there's some video unit that's 15 feet away from them. And they look like these tiny little thing. Yes. Like, Fine. You guys want to have us all up there? Great. Also, pop up your monitor so we can see your face. Interesting. Yeah, think about the remote. Like, like I know people who take the, if one person wrote, everybody's remote, take the meeting from your desk. I'm, I like, look, if you guys want to all, all come into a room and, ha and also join in, great. But think about the dynamic that you're having. Because otherwise, what you're really doing is you're having a meeting in a room and you have remote listeners who occasionally get to interject, but they're really the audience to this panel that's up on stage. Interesting. I have my weekly management meeting. Everyone from the management team is in Copenhagen, except me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the only one on the screen sitting there and everyone else is speaking. So it's, it's, a, yeah, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting thing. I'm really thinking about whether or not that will become a better meeting for me or not a better meeting for me. I mean, I'm also a big fan of trying to eliminate meetings. So here's one of my, my lesson tips for all regularly scheduled meetings. You should have death criteria. What would it take to be possible to kill the meeting? Write those down. And then try to make those become true. Now, for like a management meeting, you'll never really kill the meeting. But you can no. turn it into its next incarnation. So if right now you're like going around the room and getting status from everybody... Why isn't the status transmitted like into a chat message right beforehand? Everybody can read everyone's status. You don't have to worry about running out of time. If people need to cross coordinate now, they've, they've got written down. Oh, hey, this is the thing I need to pay attention to. I like that idea. What else? If you go through the 1% leadership, I know there's a lot of lessons distilled in there. From your experience, which one do you think sticks out the most as something that's different from what is happening in many companies but from your perspective is the most important one so i know oof, the most important one um Not the i'm most actually going with the, the one that, that was is, uh, is, is yeah. creating most of so for instance the career planning thing that we talked about you know the, the yeah. way of approaching somebody of saying do we box you in as a i want to talk to you about how you become successful at our company or do we talk you to you about how do you become successful as an individual for me that's like an incredible valuable thing because yep the motivation you get out of it and you know it's it's a complete game changer do you have yeah, more of those lessons it's hard to pick only one it's like asking me for my favorite <laughs> child yes like, i know start um, from, start from the top whatever came to your mind the first time and then yeah so so I'm, so I, I had two but i'm gonna go with the one that was first in my mind which was actually the working draft title of the book um which is unsolicited advice won't always apply and this is just about being an active listener as you speak. Like, let's say that there's a thing you do that works for you. Like, yeah. I always tell people I'm fantastic. Like, yeah. if you ask me how I am, of I'm course. fantastic. But that's just my reflexive answer. Um, yeah. Some people it doesn't work for. It works for me. It makes me better off. Everybody else seems to love it. And so I could just tell you, Robert, every time somebody asks you how you're doing, like, tell them you're amazing. Like, come up with some great yes. word to use, right? But yeah. what I have to recognize is that won't always apply to people. And I, you didn't solicit, you didn't ask me for this advice. I just gave it to you. And the way in which I give it is really important. If I say this will work for you, or even if I imply that and it doesn't, I've completely shot my own credibility forever with you. You yes. think I'm a snake oil salesman at this point. And worse, I can make you feel like I'm demeaning you by saying it. Because you'll be like, well, Andy says this works for everybody, and it didn't work for me. So therefore, Andy thinks I'm not good as a human being. 
Like I never said those words, but that's what you might internalize. If instead I say, hey, you know, one of the things I do, because it works for me, is I tell everybody I'm fantastic. It seems to brighten up their days. And when I'm actually having a bad day and I say I'm okay, the people who know me get concerned and they say, hey, Andy, what's wrong? What can we help you? Whereas when I just said I was, you know, not bad or okay, like they would never notice when I had a bad day. And so my bad days stand out, but my good days help everybody get better. Mm. And it works for me. And now you can decide if you want to borrow it or not, because I haven't told you, like, you have to join my cult. What do you have other examples of that? Of where you don't because I, I do something, I think I do something similar when I listen to that. So when I when I when I try to share things that has worked well for me, I always try yep. to use the frame of saying, this has worked really well for me. Right. I don't know if it will work for you. <laughs> but That's perfect, but the, right? But this is how it's worked for me and why. But then it also, um, I actually struggled with that when I started uh, leading people and, and being like a manager because I, on one end, I'm like, I want to, share information they can use to be better but on yep. the other hand i'm also cognizant about um what i know is only what i know and potentially they could find you know they they can they, they can find ways that are right. 10 times better than what i made way as you know so how do you balance that how do you balance the how much do I share and not force, but when, how much do I process? You know, I would like you to see you do this, this, and this as in a, you know, how do you actually do that, right? I, I actually found that, still find it pretty difficult. I, I think I've solved it in some way, right? But how do you work with that? So I think it it varies based on the person, right? Yeah. Leadership is so situation dependent. There are people whom you just put nuggets out there and they will take them and eat them and run with them and it's fantastic. Yeah. And there are other people that you have to beat over the head with the bat because you're like, what you are doing isn't working and they're not listening. And so yes. you can't say, well, do the same thing for both of them. For the people who you know don't take the nuggets, the problem usually isn't that you were too gentle on the nugget. It's usually that you, you haven't really told them that the experience that they're giving people is a problem. Hmm. And so, so I'm a big fan of, there's a, a corrective model of giving feedback called EEC, evidence experience change. I'm actually yeah. a big fan of just EE. Like, let me tell, give you evidence. You had an interaction with the client in which you said these words, experience. Here's how the client experienced it. They reached out to me. They were very unhappy. <laughs> and then stop. Like, don't tell them to change anything. No. Just stop right there and let them and hear let them it. Solve it let them process and go oh i clearly need to change that because robert's unhappy with me i won't get to be part of this family anymore um if i keep pissing off clients like that's very obvious let yeah. them finish that change and then when they say well what could i do now you say ah here's something that has worked for me in a moment that felt similar yes right now they're ready to listen whereas if you just jump to it they're gonna be like oh that won't work for me and what's not negotiable is that they need to change. What is negotiable is how they change. Yes. It's interesting because the way I won't say I solved it, right? But I, I, I had a concrete example. I uh, I went through our CRM system and then I just went through some customers and I looked at how was how had the interaction been. And then for some of them, I don't felt the interaction was where it needs to be. Some important clients, you know, you, they, they were they, they, the concrete example is there was no meeting resume. So there was a meeting that I could see a meeting had taken place yep. and no summary was sent with a meeting resume, which for me is like, that's insane. <laughs> how, can you, how can you not do that? Right. And then I was I was about to tell uh, the, the rep in question and saying, hey, you, you have to do this. Like, I mean, from a customer standpoint, I customers forget you forget everyone forget you, right. you need to kind of do that it's like a standard thing and then i recalled i hadn't set that expectation right i mean nowhere had i told this rep that you have to do a meeting with me and i was like okay actually in order for me to kind of follow up and you know do this i need to set a certain expectation about what it is and then we're back to it like do i then tell you i want you to send a meeting resume i want you to send it in this way and that da, 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 da. 
uh, whereas they might be able to do it in a different way. Let's say they leave a voicemail or they, they send, I don't know, pigeons or smoke signals, whatever. It's some other way of kind of getting to the value of making sure that everyone understands what has been agreed. And what I kind of set up is I try to explain, you know, it's important when you have an interaction with a customer that they understand what has been agreed between the parties. And yep. then I said, this is how I'm doing it. This is what worked really well for me, the meeting resume. And you're free to improve it. Great. And that worked. And that 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 worked for me because then I know. Okay, now I now I actually established a baseline. So it's like if they do something completely different, they have to explain to me, you know, why is that better or different than your baseline? But why is it I I chose to do something different? But then you kind of have something, right? I missed that before. Yep. No, that's a great way to do it, right? Here you can improve on this, but here's a baseline you could use. Yeah. I like that. I have another question for you, if you have time. Okay. We have one, we got, I think we have time for about one more. <laughs> <laughs> um, diversity and inclusion. Yep. Um, it's something we work with a lot. Um, and I think it's, it's incredibly important. You you asked, you, you mentioned that that's also something you've been working a lot with. It is. And I would like you to kind of, if you could phrase out, why do you think it's important? And what do you think is, is the biggest thing that many companies miss around this topic? Yep. So I'm going to tell you that, first of all, I think inclusion is the single most important thing. Diversity is a side effect. You can't right. put diversity ahead of inclusion. No, let's talk right. about inclusion then. The reason that it matters is you are trying to bring people into your workforce to do work. And if you exclude some percentage of the population because you make them feel not welcome, which tends to map to diversity, then you're fishing in a very narrow pool. And it's probably the pool everybody else is fishing in. So let me just like apply right to your and sort of enlightened capitalism. If you want to hire more people, you should be casting a wider net than everybody else does. Like, yes. boom. Now, once they show up, inclusion is why they stay. And I define inclusion very simply. Inclusion is reducing the energy cost that people pay just to exist in the space. So they're bringing energy to work and a bunch of that energy is being thrown away because they don't feel welcome. Maybe yes. the women's restroom is three floors away from them. Uh, maybe they're stressed out because you have meetings that run until five and they have to go pick up children, right? Maybe there's nobody else who looks like them. Maybe they have dietary restrictions that aren't satisfied in the company cafeteria, like whatever it is that they need as a human being, you are not meeting it and they waste energy stressing about those things. Now, a bunch of those things align up with you know, racial or gender or religious categories. And so mm -hmm. we talk about diversity, but diversity is just an outcome of inclusion. And you can't just say, oh, look, we need more women in the workforce, let's hire women. Because if, first of all, if you don't make women feel included, they're going to show up and they're going to leave. But that's probably you should hire the candidates that you want. And if you say, oh, look, it turns out there are women returning to the workforce after being away, you know, what program could we create that would entice them, that would train them, that would develop them? And hey, if it works for a dad who was away from the workforce, great, he can come in too. That's interesting. I read a right. study. Just, that but how do you make them feel included and use diversity metrics as a way to test and say, why is it that I only have 5% women in my organization? Like, how am I making them feel excluded that they don't want to be here? But you don't solve that problem just by saying, we will only hire women for a while. Solve your inclusion problem so that they will stay and figure out, like, where are you filtering women out? Do you think that's why a lot of uh, female leaders end up quitting like faster. I, I read some studies that what we see is there's been this, this move towards getting more and more women into leadership positions. But now it seems like a lot of women choose to leave the leadership position. Do you think that's an inclusion issue that? So I suspect it is. They, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at each one of those organizations and say, oh, like, did you did you telegraph that even if you hired a qualified woman, but did you telegraph that she was hired because she was a woman? First of all, you just sabotaged her. 
Yes. Because everybody's going to be, oh, you're not qualified. Oh, no, she was qualified. But you said, oh, it's important for us to have had a woman hire. That, like, mixed message yeah. that you're going to send there. So you should now... Her energy cost has just gone up just to exist in a space because she walks in and she has to question who in the room thinks she doesn't belong there. Like, this is the challenge I have with a lot of the ways companies implement diversity programs is they're sabotaging the very people that they're trying to help. So how do you do that? How did you do? How did you work with that to create the inclusion? To I mean, we just worked to say what are the things people needed. You know, one was when people were done with their parental leave, we said okay. You've returned from parental leave. You have to, you know, under U.S. law, like you have to come back in the, the day after your leave. Like I can't get away from that because it was technically disability. Yeah. Um, but then I would send them back home. I'm like, you're only here for one day that week, just the day to satisfy. Now we'll we'll let you figure out childcare and everything else, work part time. Like if that takes you six weeks to get back to a full time schedule, I'm fine with that. Like what's six weeks as an employer? I don't care. If I get to keep you like, that's just a little thing to reduce their energy cost. Yeah. And that's a signal that says, I care about you as a human being. And then every time there was an issue, you know, we let people tell us what their preferences were for which cubicles. Cause we thought everybody wanted to sit next to the glass, right? So you get, you get exterior light. No, we had people who hated it, who were senior that we would have given glass. And they're like, no, no, I like the dark. I want to sit as far away from any window as it can. Like, stupid little things that let people tell you their preferences and then solve for them did you then end up with a diverse environment did you end up yeah so my my organization gender yeah when i when i left akamai was 40 percent women in an information security team yeah like that's unheard of for organizations what about across uh colors so across colors was, you know, we tracked it within the U.S. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I do actually have a post on it. Uh, so I don't want to quote the quote the numbers no, no, and then no, turn no. out it was wrong. Um, you know, very heavy uh, Latino population and Asian population, um, you know, was working hard on the you know, black community, building that up within the team. Those you yeah. know, much smaller numbers to work from. Yeah, yeah. So you see a little more noise in those. Yeah. Interesting. I think it's because one of the things that always strikes me when you talk about inclusion and I, that's what we talk about is, I mean, we have people in Indonesia, Peru, Ukraine, Denmark, yep. is, is the improved decision making. I mean, I think the pure performance of it, it, it's tended to, to be written off as something, oh, now, you know, you have this movement that you have to do something. I'm like, it's just sound like really sound vision, <laughs> you know, business, yep. business advice, because like, you, if you look at this, the data, it's like on average you make better decisions. You have better long-term business outcomes if you know yep. it's completely correlated. And, like, and you get to see blind spots. Yes, right? that's exactly like, it. Because oh, I, I'm willing to bet on a team that works around the globe. You think about time zones in a way people who live in only one time zone don't. Yeah, but even if you if you take a local team that is in the U.S., if you take somebody that comes from Hispanic, uh, yep. you know, background, from black background, from white background, they will have different perspectives, different experiences. If you take somebody who's university graduated could towards something yep. else across ages, it's like if you have this problem we're discussing, you know, instead of everyone being 25 year old Ivy League male, right? And they're all like, know, we "Oh, would, I know the right view answer." That problem I... with exactly the same, yeah. But we would yeah. all view it from exactly the same angle. Whereas you bring all of these different perspectives, you get all of these. I, and I, I just the way we experience it, the way I experience it when when we have it in our team is like I just we get so many different perspectives, and I just our decision making is just fundamentally better. I believe, yeah, which means better business results but i i feel like that's not what people talk about it's like oh it's this forced thing we have to be inclusive well because that's like, the way it gets implemented right when people come in and they say oh what are the what are your numbers and here's what we have to do to fix your numbers they're not talking about inclusion they're not talking about personal and professional inclusion and decision making you know they're not talking about best candidates and and people you know really resist that and they should like if you walk in and say, look, you know, for the next two years, Robert, you're not allowed to fire any women no, and no. you can only hire women. You'd be like, no and first no of all, sense. it's kind of illegal in a bunch of dis locations like to, yeah. to discriminate like that. But that's functionally what a lot of people get here that they're being told to do. So 
I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for inclusion. And I think inclusion drives diversity if it's done correctly. Interesting. Let that be the word, Andy. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you, Robert. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on. Very, very good stuff. Oh, my God. I learned a lot. We're much more aligned than what I actually anticipated. I thought that we would have more different perspectives, but it's, I won't call it scary, but that three model way is like you, you. Yeah, that, that was surprising. I've never heard that before. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much. I have hey, a good one. Thank you.